You are most welcome to this talk. It's Monday the 14th of February. Now, sooner or later, we're going to have to change strategies and go for natural immunity. We can't keep vaccinating people all the time. Sooner or later, the question is, when is that? And this is a question that hasn't really been addressed by mainstream media. And it doesn't seem to have been addressed by government agencies very much either as of now. So what I'm going to do today, and it's a fairly academic talk today, I'm going to give a lot of evidence that points out how efficient and effectively natural immunity works. So when someone's exposed to the virus, that's when they're exposed to the antigen, they get a natural immune response, they get an antibody response, and they get the, 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 the cellular response, the B and the T cell response, and other aspects of immunity we don't, we don't fully understand, at least I don't fully understand. And the immune system is incredibly complicated. And as well as that, when someone's exposed to natural immunity, the virus is going to go in through the respiratory tract. And we learn from Professor Clancy that this, that this, this generates mucosal compartment immunity, that which is in the mucous membranes, these tracks in the respiratory passages that are lined with mucus that go all the way from the nose all the way down to the tiny airways that this generates the level of immunity as well as the systemic immunity and of course natural infection gives this natural mucosal immunity and and this is effective and we know this is effective so i'm going to give some evidence for that now i'm largely basing today's study on on this paper here from the lancet but just to show you, um, this is this is why I've <laughs> been a bit distracted with this for the past couple of days. That there's a lot of evidence here. Now, the, one of the great things about this is um, all of the major journals are still allowing you to download this material free of free of charge, which is actually pretty good. I mean, they should do this for everything all the time anyway, because most of the research is paid from by the for, but by, by the public anyway, who fund the universities very largely. Uh, but so it should be like this for everything. But but it is like this. It is like this for for COVID. So, um, but largely based on this paper here from the Lancet. Now, I'm just going to give you a quick sort of idea of some of the literature we've looked at here. So there's going to be this paper from Science about immunological memory, then this one from Science, ultra potent antibodies against diverse and highly transmissible SARS coronavirus 2 variants. Uh, th this article here, this one here, this one here, I'm not going to show you them all now, but these are all, all trust me, all these are referenced and I've, I've checked all the references to all of these evidence sources, because if we're not evidence based, we might as well pack in and go home. So all of these articles here are the evidence base that we're going to be discussing. And if you wanted to spend a couple of days doing this, you could actually go through, uh, you, you could easily go through um, all, all of these and, and check them out because I always provide all of the links. It's taken me a while to go through it, but worthwhile because this is the way ahead. You see, Omicron, I believe, has fundamentally changed the risk benefit analysis between natural infection and vaccination as the way ahead. That's why I wanted to be quite uh, fastidious in, in how we give evidence for this. So let's let's launch into this now. So natural immunity. Um, so uh, natural infection induced antibodies leads uh, to lower rates of infections and not just antibodies, the memory cells as well. Now, the questions here, according to this paper here, that, that, that this paper that we're basing at, it's not really a meta analysis, it's more of a literature review but it goes through some very poignant uh, literature on it. And the other thing about this study is they, uh, the authors spent a lot of time looking through and they only included what they thought were good quality papers. So all of those papers we've looked at, according to the adjudication of these authors, uh, were good quality papers and worthy of, uh, worthy of citation. And the degree to which I've been able to look at them over the past couple of days, I must say I, I concur with that. Not all peer-reviewed, most mostly peer-reviewed, not all peer-reviewed yet because the peer review process takes time. But uh, it, we'll point out where it's not fully peer-reviewed as of yet. So the question is the strength and the duration of such protection of natural immunity. How long does it last uh, compared with that from vaccination? And the evidence I'm accumulating basically is showing that natural immunity is beating vaccination uh, hands down largely because it's a polyclonal uh, response and largely because it seems to last for much longer. So um, all those papers there, um, uh, we'll, we'll leave that for now because I want to show you uh, something else. Let, let me just um, show you a quick uh, clip here from the doctors we talked to in, in uh, Uganda. In the, in the one of the journals, mm. uh, and they were saying that 
the Omicron variant mm. eh, is the vaccine that we failed to make. Yes. In other words, mm. everyone is getting it. Is getting it, yes. Not having any serious illnesses, mm. but it's boosting the it antibodies boosting. Yes. Uh, to fight any other kind of what? Wow. COVID-19. So in other words, wow. I think in the, in the um, one of the journals. We, we did look at that quite extensively at the time. Um, Omicron is the vaccine we failed to make, and it's boosting the immune response. And, and well, what he's saying there is just so obviously true. <laughs> it's just so obviously true. Anyway, back, back to the evidence. Um, so th this, this paper looked at PubMed from, uh, from the inception of the, the, the pandemic through, through to September 2021, they were able to go through. Uh, and they looked at biological, epidemiological, various types of evidence. So biological evidence, epidemiological evidence, clinical evidence. Previous COVID infection reduces the risk of infection, which it does, and reduces the risk of hospitalisation. Now, they looked at biological studies first of all. And always, so what I've done here is I've given you the authors, I've given you the journal it's published in, and we've given the, the the title of the journal, and that is the that is the web link there. So I've done that. I've done that pretty well, um, all, all the way through. Not 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 quite at the end, but it, it just shows we've been quite fastidious about the way we've collected the uh, the evidence here. Uh, now this study here says uh, ninety five percent of patients. Uh, 95 95 percent of participants rather tested retained immunological memory at uh, about six months after having COVID nineteen. So immunological memory going through six months, but this refers to the time when the study was done. It could well be longer than that. Uh, this study, particular study, showed uh, more than ninety percent of participants had uh, CD uh, four. So th these are the T helper cells, uh, CD four plus T helper to T cell memories at one month. Well, obviously they'd have them at one month, uh, or, or not really. So the, the kind of developed after that time. This doesn't develop as quickly as antibodies, uh, and uh, six to eight months after. So, so again, six to eight months was the limit of the study. So we've got good cellular response at, at six months, six to eight months according to this study. Next study, again published in Science. Um, ultra potent antibodies against diverse and highly transmittable SARS coronavirus 2. Now, one of the things that's coming out really quite strongly in, in this study I've been doing here of natural immunity is is this. So, um, the the um, most of the vaccines, like the vaccines we've been using in Western countries, the the adenovirus vector vaccines and the mRNA vaccines, that uh, they're just giving us uh, protection, helping us to recognise the spike protein as foreign. But if you have the whole infection, of course, you have the whole virus. So you can make antibodies and T cells to the spike protein, to the nucleocapsid protein, which surrounds the actual RNA inside the virus. You can make uh, antibodies to the... I don't know if you make antibodies to the, the, the this one or not, but you certainly make antibodies to the uh, envelope proteins, the membrane proteins. And uh, I don't know about the viral, ge uh, viral genome either, but, but certainly these ones. In other words, and pl plus there's, there's about 22 others that we haven't put on here. Uh, when we looked at this, there was 22 different um, so-called epitopes, the, the, the parts of the virus that the immune system recognises being foreign. So you get this very polyclonal, very poly polyclonal response. Um, so anyway, this paper said uh, previous SARS coronavirus 2 infection with an ancestral variant produced antibodies that cross neutralize emerging variants of concern with high potency now this hasn't quite fully been uh borne out by history because we now we know more because remember this was goes back to 2021 what we know now is that um infection with delta does not provide good protection so infection with delta does not provide good protection against omicron but we do know that Omicron provides good protection against Delta, which is one of the reasons that it's gone extinct. So Om Omicron does seem to have almost sort of reset the situation to give us this high level of immunity uh, again. Moving on to epidemiological studies. Assessment of protection against reinfection with SARS coronavirus 2 amongst 4 million PCR tested individuals in Denmark. So I think we can call that a fairly, fairly large scale study. 
Uh, people who had COVID-19 uh, previously were around 80%, 80.5% protected against uh, reinfection. Now, again, this does depend on the time when the study was done. Again, this is 2021, and it does vary depending on the variant. But as we say, Omicron does seem to have this back protection against the previous variants. But they were showing 80% protection, which is pretty good. Um, and another study, where were we at? Another study here. Uh, this one's in the uh, European Journal of Clinical Investigation in Austria. So um, people who had COVID-19 previously around 91% protected against reinfection. So again, pretty good. Um, and a frequency of hospitalization due to a repeat infection was uh, 5 for 14,840 people, which was 0.03%. So we're seeing good levels of protection against hospitalization. And in all those people, in terms of reinfection, in the cohort they were looking at, there was one uh, death, 0.01% from that particular study. This study here, reinfection rates amongst patients who previously tested positive. Um, this was a retrospective cohort study in the United States. People who had had COVID-19, again, previously were 80 point, uh, 81.8 protected against infection. So we're seeing this 80 to 90% figure really quite, uh, quite uh, consistently. Again, Omicron is, slight, is, is more infectious than the other ones. There is more reinfections with Omicron. Um, but it, I believe it's also generating higher levels of immunity. Um, necessity of COVID vaccines in previously infected individuals. This is a question mark. So is this necessary? Uh, this was a retrospective cohort study in the United States. Um, and the answer here is people who had had COVID-19 previously were 100% protected against infection against that particular study. So that one was even more impressive. <laughs> uh, comparison, comparing uh, SARS coronavirus to natural immunity and vaccine-induced immunity, reinfection versus breakthrough infection. This was in Israel. Uh, people who were non-vaccinated non people had, were 13 times uh, increased risk for infection with Delta compared to those who had uh, no COVID-19 previously. So th th this is this is nothing to do with vaccination. So if someone was unprotected compared to someone who had had the infection previously, regardless of vaccination status, previous infection meant they were 13 times less likely to become infected. So 13 times. And again, we can see that represents a very high uh, percentage. Incidence of severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2 infection amongst previously infected with vaccine, uh, previously infected or vaccinated employees. So uh, this was an occupational study. Um, laboratory staff routinely screened for SARS coronavirus 2, so people work in laboratories. People who had COVID 9 pre previously were 100% protected against reinfection. So again, pretty high level of uh, re uh, protection. And we'll just we'll just have a quick look at the the limited data that's um, available from the states here. Um, this this paper here, this is the uh, which this 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 is the uh, let me show you. Here we go. Rates of incidence of large confirmed COVID nineteen cases. So these were the people that were vaccinated. Uh, th sorry, these these are the people here that are unvaccinated. That's so because this is higher risk at the top. That's right. High risk at the top, lower risk down here. So uh, people that are unvaccinated, high risk, of course, uh, but people that were vaccinated, lower risk, but people who'd had natural infection, way lower risk. That's the line for people that had previously infection, even if they weren't uh, vaccinated. In fact, these, this line was not vaccinated. This line had had previous infection and were vaccinated, and we see they're about the same. So previous infection from this data it is giving comparable levels of uh, protection whether you're vaccinated or, or, or not and the, the same was actually true for hospitalizations in this study as well so this one was um hospitalizations and again we see high risk here for people that are unvaccinated this line here but then we see much lower risk for people that were vaccinated that's that thicker blue line there but then the thin blue line is people that had previous infection but weren't vaccinated and again the darker line people that had, had previous infection and were vaccinated and again we see virtually no advantage to vaccination on top of natural immunity 
So it, this is just so obvious what we need to be doing here. We need to be testing people and if they've had natural infection, this data has shown there's no advantage to vaccinating them. For, for, and we just need to we need to be doing more of these tests so instead of rolling out all these millions of antigen tests now which basically are irrelevant because the virus is everywhere anyway in, term, in the days of omicron we need to be testing for antibodies and evidence or, or evidence of of previous infection and if that's the case this data is showing there's no advantage to future to, to further vaccination if they've already had the infection we're, we're doing a one size fits all at the moment and that goes against everything I understand about individualised uh, medicine. Clinical studies, um, I won't bother going through all these, you, you can read them in detail if you'd want to, but this is the siren study, so this, this, is, this is, actually I will go through this one. SARS coronavirus 2 infection rates of antibody positive compared with antibody negative healthcare workers in England. So this is a very large scale study, a lot of my uh, friends and colleagues have been involved in this. Large multi-centre prospective cohort study previously diagnosed of COVID-19, 84% risk of 84% decrease risk of infection. Now, this is just a huge, huge study, huge study, um, and that's that's pretty definitive data. Uh, another study here, um, SARS coronavirus two zero positivity. That's that's whether they're testing positive for um, <coughs> antibodies, and subsequent infection risk in healthy young adults. Uh, prospective study. <coughs> I think it was done in US. Yeah, this one was done in US Marines. Uh, again, eighty two percent protection. So we'll see. We're seeing this again, and of course they didn't get as sick, and they didn't get sick for uh, as long. As we say, Omicron people are getting reinfected more, but the illnesses are overwhelmingly milder. Uh, again, reinfection here. This was 9,000 people in this study, and the reinfection rates were only 0.7%. So even more protection. So what are we saying here? Uh, risk of repeat SARS coronavirus 2 infection decreased by 80% to 100% among those who had previously had COVID-19. Studies were large and conducted throughout the world, and again, as we said, the paper picked good quality studies. Protection from reinfection is strong and persists for more than 10 months at follow-up. And we've already given the reference for Hansen et al. And again, of course, as time's going on now, this time period is still extending. Now, this paper studied, uh, published in Nature, sars coronavirus 2 infection induced long-lived bone marrow so long-lived uh, bone marrow plasma cells. So the plasma cells are the uh, are the B cells. These are memory cells. So th these are the B cells, the B lymphocytes. And why are the B lymphocytes important? Because these are the cells that actually produce the antibodies. So the memory B cells could produce lots of specific antibodies, these Y-shaped molecules in very large amounts in very short notice as stimulated by the CD4 cells, which are the T uh, helper cells that stimulate the B cells to do that. And all the while, we've also got these uh, CD uh, plus eight receptor cells, which are the T uh, cytotoxic cells. Which will directly kill virally infected cells so we've got these different arms of the immune system and they all seem to be primed and they can be identified now clearly you don't want to be taking bone marrow samples of everyone quite quite a, an invasive procedure um, patients don't like getting bone marrow samples usually you, you normally have to stick a needle into the sternum or into the uh, into the uh, the pelvic bones to, it's quite an invasive procedure that, that's why we haven't got a lot of data on it it's not just like taking a blood sample a study amongst post-infections individuals who experienced mild SARS coronavirus 2, mild infections induced a robust antigen-specific long-lived humoral immune uh, memory. And it's a long-lived humoral immune memory. Humoral, of course, means it's in the uh, fluids of the body, and that's exactly where these antibodies circulate, in the body humours. So that is cellular immunity generating the humoral immunity. Now, this study here, this is really quite important. T-cell response to sars coronavirus 2 infection in humans, a systematic review. sars coronavirus 2 infection in induces specific and durable T-cells, which has multiple sars coronavirus 2 spike protein targets or epitopes, 
and, 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 as we looked at on that previous diagram, as well as other SARS coronavirus to target proteins. So again, we see that the natural infection, I mean, just look at, here's a picture of this virus. This is the public domain one from, from Wikipedia. And the complexity of it is incredible. So all those different molecules on there, which can be inducing an immune response. And that's just the outside, of course. We can't, we can't see the ones in the middle. So we know that in, in the middle, we have these, uh, other, these other proteins that we've shown that will also generate the immune response, as we saw from that simplified, very simplified diagram there of the other components. See, all of these components aren't human, therefore they'll be recognised as foreign. They're all non-self all non-self components, obviously. So broad, broad spectrum polyclonal. SARS coronavirus 2 specific T cell immunity in cases of COVID-19 and SARS and uninfected controls. People who recovered from SARS coronavirus infection in 2002-2003. So this is what we could call the, the, the SARS coronavirus 1. Um, the people who'd had that in 2002-2003 continued to have memory T cells that are re reactive to SARS coronavirus proteins 17 years later on. Maybe that's the most profound thing I've said today. So people that had uh, SARS, severe acute respiratory syndrome, in 2002-2003. When this study was done in 2020, they were still generating an immune response to the original SARS coronavirus, what we could call type 1, 17 years before. So the immunity lasted for 17 years. Let me just say I don't expect vaccine immunity to last for 17 years. Does this mean to say that it will be the same with SARS coronavirus 2? Of course not. But it's pretty promising that that's how long. So, and of course, SARS coronavirus 1 now no longer exists. It's, it's not there. But we do know that people that were infected with SARS coronavirus 1 have got good levels of immunity against SARS coronavirus 2. So again, pretty promising because they are, they are different viruses. Memory B cell response to SARS coronavirus 2 evolves between 1.3 and 6.2 months after infection. So the fact that what, what you find is that the... the when the cellular response is delayed by several months after active infection, that tends to bode for longer term protection. So epidemiologically, we've got this indication of longer term protection from natural immunity from the SARS coronavirus 2002-2003. And also from the, the biological perspective, because the cellular response is taking longer to be generated, in, in with other infections, that means that the immune response will likely last for longer if it's consistent with other infections. And to be quite honest, why should it be any different? Uh, some people who have recovered from uh, coronavirus might, might not benefit from coronavirus vaccination. That's putting it really quite mildly. That's that paper there. Not peer-reviewed, so it's a preprint, but um, that's what that's saying. Some people who have recovered from coronavirus might not benefit from coronavirus infection which of course is 100% consistent with the, this data from the states this limited data here so people way down here who've had the infection basically that line is on the same trajectory as people who've had the infection and have been vaccinated so would you be on to want to be on the solid black line or would you be on the, on the dotted blue line what does it make much difference really does it so that indicates that uh, the vaccine wouldn't make much difference as the natural infection would. Uh, one, study, um, one study found that previous COVID-19 was associated with increased adverse events following Pfizer vaccine. Okay, so that's saying the vaccine could actually be doing harm in people that were infected. And this has led to the thinking in Switzerland in Switzerland, proof of recovered infection, so you've had a test, you've had a test, you've been diagnosed, you've recovered, in the past 12 months are considered equally protected as the fully vaccinated. And of course, this is completely correct, as the CDC's own line shows. It's, it's the same. <laughs> it's essentially the same level of protection. That's the protection against hospitalisation. That's from the uh, California one. 
and the New York data that shows the protection against hospitalization. Again, uh, if you've had the infection, the vaccination gives no further benefit. So they seem to realize this in Switzerland, but in my country, we're not bothering to differentiate. And I use that, I use that phrase quite deliberately. We're not bothering to differentiate our vaccination strategy for people that have been infected naturally or not. We're not bothering to do that. And this goes against everything I understand about individualised uh, medicine, as, as I've said. Um, so that's what we're doing in Switzerland. Right. Uh, direct, finally, direct quotes from the paper. Although longer term follow up studies are needed, of course, you always say, but <laughs> I, mean, I don't know if you should be allowed to say, <coughs> allowed to say that, really. Um, when I, when I was marking a lot of academic essays, we always uh, we actually had a rule that says students are not allowed to say that more research in this field is necessary. The research we've got is the research we've got. Of course, we're going to know more next year in 50 years time, 100 years time. Of course we are. It goes without saying. But anyway, that, that's why did they bother saying that? It's so evidently true. Anyway, clinicians should remain optimistic regarding the protective effect of recovery from previous infection. According to these authors, policymakers should consider recovered from previous SARS coronavirus 2 infection equal to immunity from vaccination. That's what the data is showing, but we're not bothering to uh, differentiate. So uh, remember what the Ugandan doctor said, uh, Omicron is the vaccine that uh, we failed to make. And for those of us that did make to make, did manage to make vaccine, has Omicron made vaccination obsolete? If you've been infected with Omicron, has that made uh, vaccination obsolete? Is a pressing question that we really need an answer to from Chris Whitty, Patrick Valance and the CDC and all these guys really soon. You know, you, know, you, you get these people in the BBC, we have, we have these, um, or any mainstream media really, we, we have these briefings for the Prime Minister and they get in to ask these questions. So they actually get the Prime Minister, they get, they get Patrick Valance and Chris Whitty and, and all these people there and they get to ask these questions. But because they're not scientists and doctors, maybe they don't ask the most penetrating questions. So um, is, is, is our mainstream media failing to ask the most penetrating questions of our politicians and scientists is another question I, I, will, I will leave you with. But that, that, that's the penetrating question. We must have answers to this soon. If someone's already been exposed to natural infection, should we still be vaccinating them? And we really need a question for that because all this evidence is showing that the natural immunity is really pretty good. OK, thank you for watching.